In this talk, we are going to explore more in detail the neural network framework uh, from the single building blocks, what they mean, how they are used, why they are used, to the training process. So how it is performed and the, technical, the technicalities that uh, um, take place during the training. Let's get started. So I want here to underline a few basic concepts that we are going to uh, encounter during this talk. Uh, first and foremost, we have data. So neural, network, uh, neural networks work on tensors. Tensors are just uh, basically a big structural representation of numbers. Uh, you may know some of them like vectors, matrices. We are going to see in details what I mean later. Uh, this, this data flows within a structure. And this network structure is composed by layers that have a single computational elements of a network. And these layers are arranged together, composed in uh, linear uh, sequences, like chains, or can be even composed in more uh, elaborated structures, like graphs. And then in the final part of this talk, we are going to have a look in detail at the network training. So the training data, the example that I use, and what do they mean? the procedure of training in terms of minimization of one uh, loss function, and this loss function itself. So what it is the quantity that we use to guide the training. I want to use a network in order to describe neural networks, because I think it's uh, very good if we have something that uh, has a purpose to analyze. And here I'm using this simple classification network. And you see, like, image goes to class. This is what we want to do with the network. And uh, we are going to basically uh, cut this network in pieces and see for each element what it does and why it has been put there. So this is the network that we are using. Uh, we have this list of layers. Don't, don't get uh, scared by them. Uh, we are going to analyze them in details. Uh, we start with some operations that you may recognize from classical image processing, like convolution, or uh, we have mm, downsampling, and uh, then we have linear, like or affine operations. I mean, standard, standard, very simple arithmetic and um, mathematical operations. And uh, one I have specified these layers. But the important thing to know is that, uh, for example, this convolution layer contains parameter that will be adjusted during the training to perform our classification. But I say that the first topic was uh, data. So um, let's talk a bit about uh, uh, tensors and how I can use them to store data and how I can convert or encode my input into the correct tensors and decode the final output, in, which is given as tensor again, into something that I can work with. So tensors. Uh, you may have not heard the word tensor, but I'm sure you have heard uh, uh, specific instances of tensors. For example, the rank 1 tensors are usually called vectors, and they are just list of numbers. Then you have the matrices that uh, you, you, you can feel it. I'm, I'm adding one dimension here, so this is called rank 2 tensor, and this is a list of a list of numbers. And this can be generalized, of course, to rank n tensors that are list of list of list of list of list of numbers, I mean, arbitrary complex. Um, then there is uh, usually the notation of rank zero tensors that are called scalars, and these are simple numbers. Uh, one thing to pay attention to is that in our framework we don't use scalars, so uh, single numbers are always put in one list and they are a list of length one. So how can I understand and how can I know what is the rank of a tensor? In the workflow language there's this function that is called array depth, and you can plug an object in, and I put one, oh, yes, let's initialize. I put um, one, and what I get is zero, exactly what I expect. Or if I put this matrix in, I expect rank two, and indeed, I get two. So not to be too theoretical, let's see some practical applications, or oh, some practical instances, actually. So what are tensors in real life? Uh, here I have vectors, one tensors, and as I can see here, they can be used to represent, for example, points in the plane. These are all vector of length 2, and they are rank 1 tensors. Uh, another thing that uh, tensor of rank 1 can do is uh, represent classes, and this is very important for what we are going to do today. And uh, so how, how, to, how do I represent the categorical variable 
with a vector, I can just use an orthonormal basis. And you see here, I have only one, one, and the rest is zero. And the position of the one tell, tells me in which class I am, class A, class B, or class C. Uh, if we move to rank two tensors, so matrices, we can imagine them as the data contained in a grayscale image. So at each uh, pixel, I have one number representing the amount of color, or white or black, uh, which is contained in that pixel. And if I want to move to higher level tensors, I still have a good metaphor with images because uh, uh, rank three tensors um, can be seen as a color image. So now I have a list of lists. So uh, this color image contains three rank two tensors and one for each color channel. I have uh, one for red, one for green, and one for blue. So I've been talking about images and tensors, but uh, how, can you, how can you go from the image, which is the input of our final classifier, to the correct tensor for the network? So let's have a look here. I can use netextract to, have a, to peek at the first layer on the network. And we see here it's called convolution layer. But what I want to focus on right now is that this has an input port that requires a tensor of size 3 times 32 times 32. But now I start with an image. How can I modify an image to be this kind of a tensor? Uh, we can see here that if I use uh, this generates a tensor of the wrong uh, dimension, and, and, and this is complaining. But even if I put an image right in, this is exactly what I want to do. The network is complaining. This is because this, these tensors are or not even tensors in the case of an image, or they have the wrong size. In order to handle this in a very clean way, you can define a net encoder. Net encoder acts basically like any other Wolfram language function. I have to specify the object that it will take, an image. And this image will be converted in a tensor of size 32 times 32. And I also say that the color space is RGB. So this is basically the first three in the dimension. So we have three given by the color channels times 32 times 32. Let's see what happens. Here, if I define this and I run it on this sample image, I get a list. And if I check the dimension of this list, it is exactly what I need. Now let's have a, a look at what happened to this tensor. We can, I can use array plot to visualize uh, the values in this, uh, at the first level of this tensor. And we see that every image channel was basically rescaled to the correct size. This is just a visualization. Of course, the network is going to take the numbers. When I'm done with the computation, I mean, all this data has just flown through the network. And I want to have the correct class for the image. But uh, uh, as I said, the network works with tensors. And if we have a look at the last layer, we see that outputs a vector of size 10. So how, how can I convert this vector to a proper um, string that will tell me about the class? I define a decoder. And in this case, I want to decode the class. And I have a variable that uh, contains the classes. We can even have a look at them. And uh, what this decoder does, it takes the vector in. And this vector represents the probability for each class. We're going to see later why. And it will pick the highest probability, check the correspondent class, and in the end, return the class as a string. Now that we've seen what, what kind of data is worked on by the network, we, it's time that we have a look at the network itself. So how is this network structured? I mentioned at the beginning that uh, the single elements are the layers and that they are grouped together in chains or graph. So let's uh, have a closer look at uh, each of these three concepts. So layers. Layers are basically a representation of simple operations on numeric tensors. And they usually produce another tensor. And uh, most layers, in, in our case, every layer of our network takes one input only and returns only one output. But there are also more complex layers that can uh, integrate two inputs or produce two outputs. And they have more um, exotic operations. Uh, some layers are very, very simple. They perform operations. They can do like a max or a total or a flatten. And they don't have any parameter. But of course, this wouldn't explain the, the power of neural networks. And the power of neural networks comes from the fact that uh, layers, um, many layers have uh, trainable parameters. And these parameters are learned or tuned during the training. 
Yeah. Again, even with one uh, layer with layer number of parameters, you, you couldn't do much. I mean, those are simple operations. You cannot uh, recognize uh, the class of the, an image object with uh, a convolu single convolution. And so what you do, you combine layers together into chains or graphs. Again, use, let's use net extract to, to have a look again at the first layer of our network. But now, let's analyze in detail what this does. This is a convolution layer. And we can see in this summary box that we can even have more details. And we see what's the input coming in, what's the output. And there are parameters here. So what this convolution layer does, uh, the syntax is convolution layer nk. And this represents not a single convolution, but a bank of n, which is the, this n here, is the number of convolutional kernels. And k represents the size of a kernel. So we can see here that uh, we have 20 kernels here, and the size is 3 by 3. And there are also more uh, sophisticated parameters like stride, the, the, the lateral stride when I, when I move along the image, or I, have, I can specify padding. But I, I don't want to go in details here. I mean, this was trained just using the default values, and they are often very, very good for, for what you need to do. Um, this may be quite confusing, so let's have a look at what, uh, let's cut the network. I can use take and cut the network and have a look at, uh, um, at what this first bank of convolution is doing. So I have an input, i is my old image of a cat, and we see that now I have 20 images, because I mean, this was, was producing 20 channels, so I can imagine this as an image of 20 channels or, or 20 rank 2 tensors, and each of, one, each of them is the output of an image convolution. So we can basically imagine that this is a bank of filters that uh, they measure, they compute something on the image. Once we have done this computation, what do we do? Uh, let's have a look at the second layer. The second layer is called element-wise layer. And again, let's have a close look. This takes tensor in input, which has this uh, 20 channels, 30 by 30. And we see that the output is the same, because this layer doesn't affect the dimension of my, of my tensor, it just performs a simple nonlinear operation on the, on the tensor. Uh, and this nonlinear operation is specified by the function parameter. So the syntax here is uh, element-wise layer k. And uh, k, in this case, is ramp. But uh, uh, in the workflow language, we do support uh, other nonlinear non functions, like a hyperbolic tangent or the logistic sigmoid. Uh, this ramp function uh, is uh, also known as rectified linear unit in the literature. You have may seen it mentioned with the acronym RELU. And why do we use here this nonlinearity? Uh, basically, the convolution operation that we did before is linear. So if we stack linear or uh, even a fine transformation, we cannot have very sophisticated behavior. Uh, while with, with this uh, activation or transfer function, as it was known in the old literature, um, we can uh, ex basically explore a different part of a phase space. Let's, I mean, this, what this do is, is, is very, very simple. Let's have a look. Uh, here I'm computing the, the range uh, for each of these channels. You can see that they span from negative to positive. But uh, after the application of the element-wise ramp function, all the negative part was clipped to zero. What's the third layer? The third layer is called pooling layer. Again, I want to open this, and we see that this layer is indeed affecting the output shape of our tensor. So what is, what is this pooling layer doing to affect the tensor? This also, uh, the syntax is pooling layer k, uh, and uh, k represents, again, a kernel size. Uh, what, uh, what the layer is doing with this kernel? We can see in this image here, it will slide this kernel, in this example, is like two by two kernel. And we'll perform an operation here. Uh, the default operation is max, but you can specify others. And then it will output a single value and, you, and place it in the, in the output tensor. So what is this thing is doing, basically? And, and we can see it here in the visual representation. In image processing uh, terms, is uh, applying a max filter and then a downsampling. Why I put this layer here, or why it's usually put here? Um, for two main reasons. Uh, one very, very simple is that uh, it uh, reduces the amount of trainable parameters, like a smaller, 
smaller uh, tensor means uh, less parameters that I have to adjust during the training. But there's also a very good theoretical reason for using this kind of layer. And the reason is that uh, if I want to classify something, it shouldn't be very important, uh, the small difference, the differences between closed pixels. And, and what this thing is saying is uh, that we are averaging, or are not averaging, we are maxing over small neighborhoods. So we are really not taking into account these small differences. And uh, the final result is that we have a measure of uh, spatial invariance in, in our network. So just by using specific layers, we can have the network learn uh, or like exhibit specific properties. The convolution part, the convolutional part of the network was repeated a couple of times to extract and fine tune the features. And then after that, we have this layer, which is called dot plus layer. This is a very famous layer with another name. Uh, I will mention it later. And uh, this layer we see takes an input a vector and gives an output a vector. So what is this layer doing with the vector? Um, again, let's have a look at the syntax first. I call it with a dot plus layer n. And n, in this case, is the size of the output vector. How this output vector is produced? It's very simple. This layer contains a matrix, and it performs the dot product of the matrix with the input vector, and then sums a vector of biases. And this vector has the same size as the output vector. And so basically, this is the prototype of an affine operation, of a fine transformation. And um, the name of this layer is, um, the, the name that you will find uh, often in the literature is fully connected layer. Why so? Because this matrix operation basically means that we are uh, connecting each input channel to each output channel. So every output value depends, uh, sorry, sorry, each output value depends on every input values. And, and this is, uh, this is uh, uh, the reason why it's used here is because when I have computed the features and I'm confident that those are good features, I want to use all of them to perform my classification. So the eleventh layer is the last layer of our network and uh, it's called softmax layer. So this is again not affecting the shape but is uh, performing a very, very important normalization operation. And this is the formula here, and it's not the usual normalization where you divide by the total, but uh, you exponentiate first and then normalize. Uh, why so? Because this is the, it can be demonstrated that this is the proper normalization when you um, want to, um, when you have categorical variable, va variables. So exactly in our classification case. And again, the, we can see this as a normal mathematical operation. We can have a look when we have the final result of the last fully connected layer, we can feed it to a softmax layer, and this is what happens. So this is normalized. As I said before, it wouldn't be so interesting to have all these layers if I couldn't combine them. And the, the power of these networks is uh, that uh, once you combine them, these operations are executed in turns one after the other. Uh, let's try to follow what's happening to the data by just cutting the first three layers of the network. We have uh, one convolution, now we have seen what it does. We have uh, the, um, the non-linearity and we have the pooling. So what happens to our tensor? We, ha we had created a tensor of dimension 3 times 32 times 32. And uh, when this is fed into the convolution layer, we have another tensor in output of a new dimension. And then this is in turn fed to the non-linear layer, the element-wise layer. Which gives, me, which gives me another tensor. And this tensor is again fed into the pooling layer. I mean, you can get the vibe. Like, the, the data flows in the network and the operations are performed one after the other. Uh, this is called net chain because uh, each layer takes one input and gives in output uh, uh, a single tensor. So we cannot have branches here. Let's recreate one of the first uh, uh, prototype of neural networks, which is the classic multilayer perceptron. Uh, so we can see how, how easy it is uh, with NetChain to specify something like that. So what we have here is a fully connected layer, which is providing me with the output. We have uh, the classic uh, hyperbolic tangent activation, fu activation function, and we have five neurons as a hidden layer. And then we specify that the input is a scalar and the output is, is a scalar. 
Okay, here I have my network. I can is assigned to a variable. I can just use it, but uh, not right away because, as I mentioned at the beginning, these layers, these two layers here specifically, contains those parameters. They had the the metrics and the bias vector, and in this symbolic representation, they are, they are not initialized. I, I can have a look here, and uh, I see that there's nothing here, and so I can use the function net initialize with uh, random weights and six biases, and this will uh, put some actual numeric values in this network. And then I can just use the, any normal function. So the initialize network, inet, acts on a variable, and I can get the result in a plot. I mean, this is perfectly integrated with the rest of the world from language. Um, one, one small uh, bit of uh, notation here, given that these dot plus and element-wise layer are very common, there's this uh, sh shortened notation, so you can just uh, use a number to specify the uh, amount of uh, fully connected neurons and uh, the function itself to specify the ele element-wise layer. And then you see that this net chain is conceptually identical to the one that I defined above. One, of, one limitation of the chains is that uh, they take one tensor in input at each level and gives uh, one, give one tensor in output. How I can define more powerful and complex structure? With graphs. So net graphs uh, allows you to define the cyclic graphs. And um, so you cannot feed the output of a network within itself. But you can split at any point and uh, the flow of data and then gather it again and how many times you want. Uh, the syntax here is slightly more complex. You again specify a list of layers, but now you have also to give uh, uh, a def like a description of the connectivity. And uh, usually you can specify connectivity in a very easy way. You just uh, name your layers, and then you use rules to connect uh, one to each other. And when you have multiple layers, you can use the uh, symbol net port to give a name to the... Um, sorry, when you have multiple outputs, you can use net port to give names to output channels or to input channels. Let's have a look to let's clarify a bit what's what's happening with uh, with an example. Here I'm defining a net graph, and I have uh, this very short list of layers. As I explained before, this is a fully connected and hidden layer of two neurons, one activation, and a couple of uh, single neurons fully connected. So this is not now a linear thing. This is um, a flat flattened list of layers. How these layers are, are connected, I specified here. So this, uh, this rule basically tells me that the data comes in first layer. Actually, the data comes in as a scalar with this input specification. And then uh, goes to the first layer, that goes to the second, the third one, and then in output with a port named Y. But uh, when the data reaches the second layer, it is also connected to the fourth and another output as net port Z. So let's define this. Let's again initialize this random weight. Oh, one thing I didn't mention, you can you can, this is interactive. You can click and see what's happening. So this is an element-wise layer. This is a fully connected layer. And this is the output. So let's initialize this network. And now I can use it. Let's, let's use it as a simple function. I need one scalar as input. This is uh, all the math, the conversion to tensor is done internally. And what I get is an association with the keys that are named with the same values that I specified in my net ports. So I can use them right away with the name uh, of my choice. And uh, given that this gives two output, I can uh, just feed it in something like list time plot. And I notice what's happening to the result. Of course, this is completely random. If I reinitialize the network, this plot is going to produce something different. So we have come to the last part of our talk today, which is training. So once I've uh, acquired my data, uh, I mean, I've defined how I work with my data, and I defined the structure of the network that is going to work on the data, I need to train the network. And I mentioned this many times, but I never defined this training. So let's have a, a more in-depth look at what's going on during the training. First and foremost, I need a training set. So I need some data to train the network on. This is because neural networks are uh, a class of data-driven algorithms. 
and uh, you can think of the, um, of the data that you use during the training as implicitly specifying a function. So basically, the connection between input and output uh, is, uh, is a function that is not written, it's not defined anywhere. I just have the, uh, what comes in and what goes out. And what I want to do during the training is try to infer what this function is, try to mimic, to learn this function. Um, in simple example like the, the classification, uh, the simple networks, you, you can just imagine your uh, input-output as just pairs, like input goes to output, input goes, input goes to output. But uh, you may have more complex application where you take multiple inputs, for example, you take uh, a vector of temperatures uh, and a geolocation, and you want the probability of uh, rain. And uh, this you can do in the framework by using uh, association or data set with named keys. So you can give a name, as we've seen before, to the different ports, and uh, get data or output data. So training. training I say that we want to learn a function, but uh, how, how can we do that technically? Uh, it's not, not so mysterious in the end. Uh, what we have, given that we have, this is supervised learning, so we have the correct output. And so we can define a function, which is called the loss function, and measures the error uh, between the output predicted, like or computed by the network, and the correct output that I have in my training data set. And, uh, and this function, of course, will be a function of all the parameters that I want to, uh, I have specified at the beginning and I want to fine tune. For example, the, the matrix and the bias vector in the dot plus layer. And let's say I want to train one of these, like for each one of the element of this uh, matrix W. W what do I do? Uh, let's call this parameter phi, and uh, the error will depend on this parameter. So we can compute this function on, uh, usually you do on batches of images, not to blow your memory. And, um, and then you use the change rule. It's very, very simple. You just uh, uh, do, you, you back propagate, this is a technical term, this error uh, from layer to layer using the chain rule. Like you, you basically stack derivatives. And in the end, you have uh, the dependence of the, um, you can see how, how this parameter is uh, affected by re the result and how the result is affected by the parameter. And once you have a definition for the gradient, it's very easy. You can just, uh, use simple gradient descent and specifying the step, or, or a, in this case it's called learning rate, and you try to minimize this function. Uh, and hopefully you will uh, converge to a local optimum, and of course the global optimum is, is even a bad thing here. We don't want to overlearn. We just want a result that is good enough. Uh, of course like this description is uh, in principle correct, but uh, you will never have good result with this because uh, the, the space of, I mean, the phase space of this loss function is super complicated. There are a lot of local uh, minima and is very difficult by gradient descent. But if you just use simple gradient descent, you will get stuck in the first local minima. So there are more sophisticated algorithms that are uh, uh, built within the language and they will use stochastic gradient descent or the ADAM method and, and they will like hopefully converge to a good optimum. So I say that the training data define a function, so let's have a look uh, uh, at how you can acquire learning data. So we have uh, here in the language, we have different data sets. Let, let's have a look at them. One simple one is, uh, um, for example, CIFAR10. This contains, uh, I can use the data set view to see that this contains images and their label. And so this is very good for uh, classification tasks like uh, the one we want to train our network for. And um, I can have more sophisticated example that are again provide built-in. This is uh, another data set that contains now 20 classes and 100 subclasses. So for example, I have this image is an image of a vehicle, but this vehicle is a bus. So this is a more, I need a more sophisticated network to uh, predict these two outputs. And then I have, um, and this is a very classical data set, which is uh, MNIST, and this contains handwritten digits. These are 28. By, by 28 pixels images that, uh, this is a very big data set and, and contains a, a lot of images. It's amazing, you can, you can train the network on this and in, in like few minutes you have a result. This, these networks are very, very powerful. So let's have an in-depth look at the training procedure. So uh, I mentioned before that we are going to use uh, this uh, um, data, data set of 10 classes, so if they are 10, 
and we import the training data, and uh, we feed them in. Uh, is this done? Yes. Now we can feed them into NetTrain. So we put the network here, first argument, the data here, second argument, and let's have a detailed look at this interface now. So by default here, we see that NetRain uh, decided to use 10 rounds or epochs. That means that uh, I will first in the network we see all the example once, twice, up to 10 times. Uh, I don't, we don't work with uh, one image at a time, but we use uh, batches. The batches are basically a group of images, and NetRain can automatically decide how big a batch is. You can also specify it by option, but uh, we try to automate it as much as possible. Uh, inputs per second tells me how fast the training is. Uh, roughly, we are processing 500 images per second. Then you can see that uh, 50 seconds have passed, and I still have to wait 15 minutes to get at the end of this uh, 10 rounds of training. And this is the loss on my function. So I pre-trained this network, so the loss is already pretty pretty low. But uh, y you can have, you can see in in this uh, dynamic plot here w what's the current status uh, of the network and how many examples were processed. So let's stop the training. When I stop the training, this network here is ready for use. It may be very good, not very good. That's uh, that has to be measured. But uh, uh, I, I will not never waste time with this system. Uh, of course, if I want to speed up things, uh, we can compare, like I was processing roughly 500 uh, inputs per second on my laptop uh, CPU. Uh, what if I use a GPU? So I'm using, a, again, a simple laptop uh, uh, GPU, but the gain is amazing. Here I process uh, four times as many images per second. And uh, the, uh, the time in this case is just cut by a factor of four, which uh, on a single GPU. You can use this on machines with multiple GPUs and uh, um, get an even greater speed up. Uh, what, what if I, okay, one, one limit of this is that this error is measured on the training data. So we see that it's going down, and, but I mean, I don't want to, what I said before, like there are a lot of local minima, and I don't want to get stuck in a local minima. So how can I be sure that I don't go there? Uh, NetTrain takes many options, among which there's validation set. So let's import some test data out of the same data set. They have the same shape of the training data. So this variable here contains uh, uh, data in the same shape as this variable here. And uh, when I evaluate this with a validation set, the interface changes slightly. I have this new element here. So I hope you can see that there are these blue dots connected by this dotted line. What do they represent? So here, at, at during round seven, so that this is a screenshot, and I have uh, executed six rounds of training already. And at the end of each round, NetRain computed the, the error on the validation set. And we can see that here, for example, this is the error at this point, and is roughly the same on the validation set and on the training set. But the more I go into the training, the more the error is reduced on the training set, but not so much on the validation set. And when you see a plateau like this, it means that uh, the network is really overfitting, is not learning much more from your data. So it's time to stop the training. I mentioned the error or loss function many times before. Uh, now it's actually the, the time to define in details what a loss function is. So lo the loss function is uh, a function, of course, that is used to quantify the error in the network prediction. And uh, the, this error is computed by comparing the output with uh, the desired output that I provide in terms of, uh, um, in this case, number of class, but it can be even a number. Um, so during the, the training, this is the quantity that is minimized. And how do I pick a good loss function? So NetRain will do that for you automatically if you specify a kind of uh, input and output. But of course, it depends on what you are going to do. So uh, this network was trained uh, for a classification task. So the, the loss function, which is also comes in terms of layer, because it's attached to the network, uh, the, the right 
loss function to use here is a cross entropy layer. And this is because we want to compare the estimated probability distribution among the classes with the real actual probability distribution, or what we think is the real one. Uh, but you have other tasks like regression, and depending on what your data is and your result is, you, we provide two other layers that are the mean squared loss layer or the mean absolute loss layer. So we are talking about classification here. Um, so I think it's good to have a closer look at least um, at one of those layers. And it will be the cross entropy loss layer. So what, what, what kind of mathematical operation this is doing? So if you check this formula, this, uh, you can see that this is very similar to the formula for the entropy. But uh, there's a little difference here. It takes two distribution in. And basically, it, um, it measures the distance of the class extracted by um, one distribution with the probability taken from another distribution. And this is the correct um, information distance between these distributions. So minimizing this quantity will bring me to match the two distribution as much as possible. So what is this true distribution, uh, quote unquote, that I mentioned before? Uh, in the classification task like this, uh, uh, if I know that an image, for example, is a cat, that means that I want to uh, assign a probability 1 of image being a cat and probability 0 to image being, in, being classified as uh, uh, any of the other classes. Um, of course, the network will not produce something like that, but uh, when I force it in that direction, uh, hopefully, uh, I will have uh, um, fine-tuned the parameter well enough that the probability of the cat class is the highest. We can have a practical look at this. Let, let's define one cross-entropy layer, and we specify here that uh, the target of this layer will be an, index, uh, an indexed value. And, and we can use it. I mean, this is what net training is doing internally. It gets an input. So this, for example, is my probability vector. And uh, you see first class is 80%, and then is uh, 5%, and 50%. And this is one of those layers that takes two outputs. Uh, sorry, two inputs. And the second input is the target class. So I know from my training data that the correct answer is the first class. And here, the first class has the highest probability. So when I compute this, I get a number which is quite low. What happens if I have a wrong prediction? So in this case, the network is uh, uh, erroneously predicting the second class as the one with the highest probability. And uh, again, I say that the correct class is the first one. So I get, I get a higher number in the result. And this is basically, in the very simple terms, the it's all of it. It's like uh, just by specifying a structure, feeding it some data in, and uh, reaching a minimum of the function defined by my example, I can learn something. Or I can make the network learn something, actually. So what we have seen today in this like, more technical analysis of our framework, um, you can use the new framework to do a variety of things. You can use it to handle your data, including pre- and post-processing. And I mean, remember that this is uh, built in the Wolfram language, so you can use all the other 5,000 functions to pre- and post-process your data. Uh, in uh, a very Wolfram language style, this uh, network building is done in a completely symbolical way. So you don't have to put any parameter at the beginning, uh, except just the minimal requirement, uh, minimal requirement to define your network. And then everything is uh, uh, like all these internal weights. You, you never have to declare variables for them. It's all done uh, within the framework for you. So the, the boring part, uh, uh, it, it's, it's done. And you can define and train your network right away. And this is the last part. We provide this uh, very, very simple way to uh, train your network end to end. One thing I would like to say before concluding is that uh, we have seen image classification today, but this is just one application of these deep, new, deep convolutional neural networks. Uh, you can do detection, you can do measurement, uh, measurements, or you can even do something uh, in the artistic domain. Uh, for example, not long ago, it was very popular. Uh, you would see a lot of these style transfer network on the, in on the internet. And these networks are trained to basically learn 
a style like how Van Gogh is uh, uh, painting and then applying that style to another picture. And of course, those nectar are huge compared to the one I showed today, but uh, uh, this is a bit beside the point. I don't, didn't want to go too in, in, into a too complex matter. But the, they are very, very powerful, and you can scale them to take a more complex application. And you can even change the basic structure. So we have seen convolutional networks here, but those are not the only feasible network structures. They are, it's a very, very rich environment, and you can uh, pick what you need and fine-tune it to your application. 